Good morning, Grace Trenton folks. Pastor Hutch here. It's good to be with you this morning, although I wish that I could be physically with you uh, this morning. Uh, it's why I'm looking forward to next Sunday. Uh, it will be our traditional um, Thanksgiving service where we have opportunity to give thanks to God as we look back on the year and remember all that God has done in our lives, His faithfulness to us as a church over the past year. And uh, it's always an incredibly special service. Uh, we're looking forward to that this year. Uh, we actually have open mic where we open up uh, the floor for folks to be able to give personal testimony to God's goodness in their life. And this year, um, we're going to add on a little component for those that are not able to join us in person. We're going to invite you uh, to record just a short little video of your own testimony of thanks and praise to God and send those into Mark, and he's going to put them together so that during the service... Uh, we'll be able to hear from folks that aren't able to physically be with us, but it's an incredibly rich time of thanksgiving and praise, and so we hope that you'll participate and join us uh, next Sunday. Well, uh, as we all know and we've talked about many times, 2020 has been uh, the year of uh, the unknown, uncertainty, uh, trouble, upheaval, and... Um, Certainly for me in the past two weeks, it's been an incredibly challenging time. Uh, as we shared with you last Sunday, um, it wasn't specifically said me, but uh, we had shared that one of the elders had tested positive for COVID-19, and that was in fact me. Uh, I had been the previous week in a meeting with the elders. We had, had a session meeting. And uh, that was within the 48-hour window of when I became sick. So we are all in quarantine. But Wednesday of that week, so it would have been a week from this past Wednesday, uh, late that night I began feeling sick and uh, for the next couple of days uh, experienced what was um, very like the flu and uh, was quite sick and uh, tested positive last Saturday. Uh, for COVID-19, and so have been in quarantine since. But uh, I wanted to start just reflecting on um, just where I'm at and what the past uh, week and a half has been like for me. It, it has been a challenging time. Uh, it's been a time of fear and anxiety. As I was walking through uh, just being sick, I, I experienced a lot of fear. Um, not a lot of fear personally for myself, uh, but just fear for what if I have gotten others sick. Uh, fear about my children. Um, we know that by and large uh, this disease has not uh, terribly impacted children, but a fear that I began to struggle with uh, was what if my kids get sick um, with some random kind of um, symptoms. Uh, so I experienced fear. Uh, I experienced discouragement. Uh, you know, one of the things with me whenever I am sick, uh, I think like most of us, I don't, I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like studying. I don't feel like pursuing God. I don't feel like doing much of anything. And oftentimes whenever I'm sick and not able to do much of anything, um, I feel guilty. Um, I began to feel uh, spiritually discouraged in the past week and a half. Um, part of what that reveals uh, in me is that so often I base God's love and His favor upon my performance, upon uh, am I pursuing Him? Uh, is my heart in a particular place of tenderness before the Lord? And whenever I'm struggling in those areas, I tend uh, to feel like God is displeased with me, that I've fallen out of his pleasure. And I was struggling with that over the past week and a half. And in struggling with that, I found myself uh, running from God. I found myself, instead of running to him, really running to my own strength or seeking to escape or seeking to just distract myself 
from my own discouragement, which when I see all of that, when I was seeing my resistance to the Lord and my wanting to run from the Lord, it makes me all the more spiritually discouraged. So the past week and a half has been a personally challenging time for me. It's been a time where I've felt distant to the Lord, uh, where I've experienced a lot of um, self-accusation, and just a time of overall feeling discouraged. And so I wanted to start with that this morning and just share with you the ways in which God has pursued me during this time and what God has used to begin to lift my heart out of that place of discouragement. And for me, it's been a very familiar place in Scripture. It's been the Psalms. Uh, I've shared this before, but the book of Psalms are the prayer book of the Bible. And the Psalms are poetry, so they have a unique ability to get underneath even our rational thinking and into the deep places of our heart. And they become a guide which takes us by the hand and leads us back into the presence of the Lord and help us to identify um, our own hearts even whenever uh, we have trouble giving words and voice to them, whenever we find ourselves in a place where we don't even know how or what to pray. And so I've experienced that this past week through the book of Psalms. And so I wanted to share with you this morning Psalm 31. And just imagining that for many of us uh, in this time, we might be ourselves walking through a time of discouragement, walking through a time of fear and anxiety, Maybe this has been a time where the circumstances in your life, maybe they're financial, uh, maybe they're health. Uh, maybe it's just the reality of not being able to be with other people and function normally in life. No matter where you are, I imagine that so many of us can identify with this place of discouragement, this place of trouble, and this place of fear. And so as we come to Psalm 31 this morning, I just want you to just allow God through his word to invite you into a place of rest, into a place of trust. Um, Psalm 31 um, really walks us into this place through a couple things. And here's what I want to see. In the first six verses, what we're going to see is the psalmist runs to the Lord in the midst of his, of his circumstances and his challenges and his trials. Where does he run? He runs to the Lord. In verses 9 through 13, the psalmist pours out his heart to the Lord. In verses 14 through 18, the psalmist chooses to trust. And in verses 19 through 22, he remembers the Lord. And then in verses 23 through 24, uh, he chooses to worship. And so let's step into Psalm 131 and allow the Lord to just invite us into this place of rest through the power of His Word. Uh, so again, in the first six verses, as the psalmist starts out, he is running to the Lord. And I just want to point out just verse 1, as he identifies right here at the beginning, what's happening in this psalm is that he is running to the Lord for rest and refuge. Look again at what he says in verse 1. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. You know, that's the, the simplest place to start here, is in the midst of his trouble, in the midst of what he's walking through in his life, his circumstances. Uh, the psalmist runs to the only place where there is refuge and peace. He runs to the Lord. Uh, he gives us in um, verses 2 and 3, gives us these two metaphors that are very common in Scripture in describing God. And he describes God as a rock and a fortress. Here's what he says in verse uh, second part of verse 2. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Now we see that popping up all over the book of Psalms that God has described as a rock or as a fortress. 
Now in the, in the uh, Near East, there is a lot of sand. There's not a lot of rock. But whenever you find a rock in places where there are large rocks uh, in the Middle East are places of refuge and protection. Now we're in a place where there's a lot of rock, especially if you live on the mountain. You probably have rocks in your yard and when your house was being built, it was probably incredibly challenging to build because there was rock. One of the things that you discover whenever you find rock is that it doesn't move. Uh, rock is secure. Rock is, um, is something that begins to uh, divert you in another direction. And that's why this the rock uh, in the Psalms is a metaphor for protection. In the midst of a world that can be chaotic, in the midst of a world where nothing seems solid, nothing seems fixed, everything seems to change. The reality is as a rock does not change, it does not move. Oftentimes in the ancient world, a rock was a place of security. It was a place of protection, it was a place to hide. Oftentimes it, it was made into a fortress. Now you know what a fortress is? A fortress is a, a big, thick, impenetrable, place that you can hide yourself in and find protection. Protection from danger, protection from war, uh, protection from uh, the elements of nature. And so because of this reality of a rock, so often God is described in the book of Psalms as a rock, as a fortress. Now what's interesting here is the psalmist comes to the Lord and he says in verse 2, be my rock of refuge a strong fortress to save me. But then in verse 3, he says, since you are my rock and my fortress. Now, what's he doing here? Why this repetition? Well, the reality is, is that uh, over and over and over in God's word, we're told that God is our rock. He is our security, our protection, our fortress, the place that we can go and find protection. But you can know that reality objectively in your mind, but yet not have the experience of that. You can know that's true in your mind, but yet not be experiencing in your heart in the midst of circumstances. So what the psalmist is saying here is, Lord, I know you are my rock. I know you're my fortress. I know you're my place of protection. You're the only refuge true refuge that I have in my life. There's no other place that I can run. But Lord, I'm asking that I would come to experience this now in the midst of my reality and my circumstances. You know, what's true is I described about just my last week and a half, and I'm sure that you can probably relate in your life. In the midst of our circumstances, there's so many places that we're tempted to run. There's so many uh, places that we're tempted to try to find security, to try to find uh, comfort, to try to find peace in the midst of a reality surrounding us that feels chaotic, where we feel in danger, where we feel uh, in a hole, where we, we feel in a place of uncertainty. There's so many places that our hearts are inclined to, to run. Sometimes we run to ourselves. I often do that. I try to run to myself. I try to solve it myself. I try to uh, escape. I try to find solutions in and of myself. I obsess over it in my mind. What are ways that I can fix this in my life? Or sometimes we want to run to other people. Sometimes other people are who we look to and put our hope and our trust in. Fix this for me. Somehow change my circumstances. But the reality is, and Scripture brings us back to this truth over and over and over. There's only one rock. There's only one place and one person in all of reality that is above our circumstances, that is in control, that is truly a place of safety and certainty no matter what we're facing in our life. And that's the Lord. And what Psalm 131 invites us into right here in the beginning is that in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our uncertainty, run to the Lord. There is no other rock. And He is our fortress. He is this immovable place of protection. And He invites, in fact, He longs for us 
as His people in the midst of no matter what we're facing, to run to Him, to run into His arms and into His presence to find that security and protection. But there's a second thing I want us to see here in the passage. That's in verses 9 through 13, how the psalmist pours out his heart to the Lord. Now we see this as he's in these verses that the reality is he finds himself in an incredibly difficult and painful circumstances in his life. Look again at what he says and just look at the incredibly visceral and powerful description of just how hard and difficult the reality of his circumstances are. Look again at verse 9. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed with anguish in my years with groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Now the reality is, is that he finds himself in such a place of pain, in such a place of fear, in of, uh, such a place of sorrow and grief that literally it is impacting his very body. I identify very much with these words. Have you found yourself, maybe even right now, have you found yourself in a place where your, your pain, your fear, or your grief is so deep and so real that literally you can feel it in your bones. Where literally your heart is breaking. Where you find yourself being physically attacked by the reality of your circumstances. It could be a sickness or it could be even a relationship. It could be a circumstance that you're facing. The reality is, is that grief is not just something in our head. Grief is something that affects the whole person. It affects the whole body. And we see that as the psalmist pours out his heart here. We find also in his description here that he is in danger. That he has enemies. Verse 11, because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. The reality is, is that he finds himself in a place where he's utterly alone. He feels deserted. He feels like no one will understand. No one will care. He feels like he has been deserted by all the people in his life that he would normally turn to for help. He is in a place of danger. Verse 13, For I hear the slander of many, and there is terror on every side. The reality is the psalmist is in incredibly challenging circumstances. He is in danger. He is all alone. He is feeling the reality of his fear and his grief literally in his body. What I want you to notice here is just how he pours out his heart to the Lord. You know, we've talked about this before, but we see this over and over in the book of Psalms. This is called lament. Lament is the reality of pouring out your, uh, your pain, your emotions, your feeling, and your grief to the Lord. It's like a, a holy complaint. It's like venting to the Lord. Now, one of the amazing things we see in the book of Psalms is that the majority of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. What does that teach us? It teaches us that God longs for us to come right where we are to pour out the full reality of our hearts to the Lord, to run to Him with our pain, that He wants to hear that. He wants to bear those burdens with us, and He invites us to come and pour out just without a filter to the Lord. Now, the reality is this is probably hard for most of us to even imagine. I think so often we tend to think that in order to come to God, we got to put a happy face on. we got to have it all together. we got to be nice. Um, we've got to uh, put a smile on. We've got to be thankful. The reality is, is that we, so often, God is the last place that we would run to vent and pour out our hearts. What's more typical for us is that we run to other people. We vent to other people. We complain to other people. Or for some of us, we just stuff it, thinking that what God wants us to be like is He wants us to be stoic. He wants us to, to just be unmoved by life. But the reality is, 
the Psalms show us God invites us into this place of vulnerability, this place of brokenness. You know, for some of us, literally one of the, the ways that we deal with pain is just to stuff it. It's just to shut down our emotions and say, I'm just not going to feel. If I don't feel, I can get through life. That's how I'm going to get through this. That's how I'm going to manage this. We have so many ways of dealing with the trouble and the grief in our life. But the reality is only lament will bring healing to our hearts. And that is what God invites us as His people to do. That in the place of pain, in the place of difficulty, in the place of uncertainty, that He would be the place that we would run and that we would pour out our hearts to Him. So we've seen here that uh, he runs to the Lord and that he pours out the full reality of his heart to the Lord in lament. But then in verse 14, I want you to see this. Where does he turn with all of this? What we see here is that then the psalmist begins to choose to trust in the Lord. Look at what he says in verse 14. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. So having fully acknowledged the reality of where he is, the pain in his heart, he says, I will trust in you. You are the one that I'm putting my hope in. You know, the reality is is that trust is a choice. You know, faith and trust is not a feeling. Sometimes we think that is, you know, that that faith is something that that I've got to feel or muster up. But the reality is, is that Trusting and faith is a choice. It's something that we choose to do in, in spite of our reality. It's, it's, it's seeing and acknowledging the reality of what we're facing. And, and very often our circumstances tend to contradict what we know to be true about God. Sometimes we're walking in circumstances where everything looks lost, where all we can see is doom, when it, there doesn't seem to be any hope, whenever we can't see a solution, whenever it just seems bitter and there seems to be no way out of it, or we just feel incredibly dark and discouraged. The reality is, is that as we look at those circumstances, it looks dim and it looks hopeless. But you see, trust is something that we choose in the face of those things. It's choosing to trust in what we cannot see. It's choosing to trust in what God reveals to be true about Himself. That He is present, that He is going to do something in my life, that He is going to take care of me. I'm choosing to trust in Him in this place, even whenever I don't feel it. And then in verse 15, we see this incredible expression of just surrender. Look at what he says in verse 15. My times are in your hands. See, the reality is is that Scripture teaches us that God is in control of every detail and every circumstance in our life. And at this place, the psalmist in this place of trust says and acknowledges this and just kind of surrenders to it and says, God... My times are in your hands. My circumstances are in your hands. What's going to happen in my life? What's going to uh, come of all of these troubles that I'm facing in my life? How long this is going to last? What's going to happen here? All of those things, they're in your hands. And so I just surrender them to you, Lord. I, I, I release it to you. The reality is He's already in control of it. Everything that we face, He has ordained, He has brought into our life for our good. And so the psalmist invites us in that place to just come into this place of surrender and just say, God, my times are in your hands. It's all up to you how long this is going to last, what you're going to do here. I just, I just release it to you and I acknowledge, Lord, that you are in control in this area in my life. And out of that place, he begins to make requests of the Lord. Verse 16, let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. The psalmist is saying, Lord, I want to feel your pleasure in this place. I want you to to shine upon me. It's this sense of God smiling and expressing his delight over us in the midst of our circumstances. So we've seen that he runs to the Lord and that he pours out his heart, the full reality of his heart, that he 
chooses to trust in the Lord. But then in verses 19 through 22, we see that he remembers the Lord. He reminds himself of the truth of who God is and reminds himself of the ways in which in the past God has shown up in his life. He remembers the Lord. Look at what he says in verse 19. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have bestowed in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. He reminds himself of God's goodness. He reminds himself of the truth that God has revealed to us in Scripture that God is overflowing in His goodness towards His people. And so here in this place, He reminds Himself of that truth. God, You are great in Your goodness towards Your people. You, you are overflowing in generosity to us. You love us. You promise to take care of us. And I remember the ways in the past in which You have shown up in my life. Look at what he says here in verse 21. Praise be to the Lord, for He has shown His wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. In my alarm I said, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. In those verses, he's remembering back in the past in ways in which God has responded, has heard His prayers, has showed up in His life, and has brought about that healing and that freedom and that provision in His life. The reality is, is that in the midst of our circumstances and our difficulties, one of the things we've got to learn to do is remember the Lord. To preach the truth of who God is to our own hearts. That's one of the reasons that it's so crucial to know God's Word so that we can then use the truth of His Word upon our life and actively remind ourselves of who God is. And then finally, out of this place... He chooses to worship. Verse 23, Love the Lord, all His saints. The Lord preserves the faithful. Verse 24, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. In this place, the psalmist actually chooses to worship the Lord. And he invites us, invites the community to join him in that. Love the Lord, all His saints. You know, I don't think he's saying this because his circumstances have been changed. I think he's actually choosing and being moved to worship even as he remains in the place of difficult circumstances. You know, the reality is there is incredible intimacy that we can experience when we choose to worship God even in the midst of brokenness, even in the midst of circumstances that are incredibly hard. That is an amazingly intimate place to say Lord even in this place where you have you have taken things in my life you brought bitter reality and circumstance in my life yet in this place because of who you are because of my trust in you I am going to choose to worship you and that's what the psalmist does here so in light of this psalm I just want to ask I just want to throw out this question for each of us even for where you are this morning in your life where are you running where do you typically tend to run whenever you face the reality of hard circumstances in your life? Do you run to yourself? Do you run to your own resources? Do you run to your own strategies for how you minimize the pain in your life? Do you stuff the reality of your pain and your emotions in your life? Do you try to put a plan together? Do you run to other people? Do you run to escape in your life? Run to things that just help you to just kind of leave it behind and, and, and just escape from all the problems in our life? Where do you run? You know, the reality is, is that I think oftentimes the reason that we don't run to the Lord is that we cannot imagine that He would be inclined towards us. I think that uh, we imagine, we can imagine that his heart would be good towards us, especially whenever we know the reality of the waywardness of our hearts, whenever we know the ways in which we run to all kinds of other places. I think very often in our discouragement we think, what, what gives me the confidence that God would love me and welcome me? So because of that, we run to all other kinds of places. 
So the question is, what is our ultimate assurance that God's heart is inclined towards us? That He loves us and accepts us even in spite of all the ways that we run to so many other places besides Him. And the reality is we find that confidence in the gospel itself. You know, the reality is is that all of the Psalms point us to Jesus. And Psalm 31 is no different. I don't know if you picked this up in verse 5, but in verse 5 we hear the final words of Jesus from the cross. Look again at verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. What does that tell us? That tells us that even on the cross that Jesus had this psalm in mind. That He was doing all of these things as He hung on the cross in our place. That He was running to the Lord. That He was pouring out His heart to the Lord. That He was choosing to trust in the Lord. That He was remembering the goodness of the Lord. But the reality is is that on the cross, the Father turned His face away from His Son. That He was forsaken for us. That, that, that in that place, all of God's wrath for our sin was laid upon the Son. Why? In order that through union with Christ, we might be welcomed as His sons and daughters. That through our union with Christ, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of Him giving up His Spirit and, and dying that death on the cross, that we now, through union with Christ, through repentance and faith, that we are brought into the family of the Father, that, that we uh, have His heart, that we have His pleasure, that we have the acceptance that He has for His very own Son that is ours through union with Christ. That's what we ultimately see in the psalm, that His heart, is good towards us because of the work of Jesus in our place. And that is the ultimate confidence that we have in coming to the Father. That His pleasure is always for us because of the work of Jesus in our place. So those of us who are united to Jesus, would you let that objective truth just invite you to run to the Lord in the midst of no matter what you're facing, in the midst of our circumstances in our life. No matter where you are right now, would you run to the Lord? Would you be confident of His goodness and His love towards you and pour out your heart to Him? Would you choose to trust because you know that He is forever committed to you because of the work of Jesus in our place? And would you even choose to worship Him in the midst of our circumstances? Let's pray together. Father, we come to You and we just thank You for the Psalms that just invite and welcome us into this place of trust, into this place of rest and freedom. And Lord, I pray that the truth of the Gospel would just penetrate into our hearts and that it would just give us the confidence, Lord, that You are for us that you love us, that we are forever accepted in Jesus. And so would we just come to you in the midst of...